right. Good evening, everyone. We're going to just give everybody like one more minute to hop on. Good evening, everyone. All right, welcome everyone. We are so glad that you're here this evening. I know this is a tough week um, with Thanksgiving. It's a short week and everybody's probably hitting the road. And so let's get started so we can get started and get ended and get on our way. Um, so the Center for Women Entrepreneurs is part of TWU's Jane Nelson Institute for Women's Leadership, and the JNIWL is dedicated to preparing women to take on successful roles in business and public service to ensure women have the education to establish careers as successful C-suite executives, the skills for building entrepreneurial businesses, and the framework needed to run for public office. And so this evening, we are so excited to have um, Kelsey Schofner. Schofner. Schofner, yes. Uh, Kelsey is a dynamic and highly strategic corporate attorney with over eight years of business advising expertise and a proven track record of balancing legal and business priorities to facilitate purposeful growth. She works with her owner operators, small business clients to balance budgets and legal spending to protect businesses from employment claims, intellectual property infringement claims, and contract disputes. At Schaffner Consulting, Kelsey works with owner operators to start and scale their businesses with proactive and practical legal advice. Kelsey holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Corporate Communication from the University of Texas at Austin and a Juris Doctorate from the University of Colorado Law School. Kelsey, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to have you. Of course. Thanks for having me. I am excited to give this presentation. I love, as Donna Lisa mentioned, I love working with startup businesses. Um, I love hearing my clients' ideas, what they're trying to do. So this presentation I love giving because it's really, uh, it's step zero to getting started with, well, maybe your, your idea is step zero, but it's step one to getting um, your business started. So let me go ahead and pull up my slides get a screen share going. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect. Excellent, let me just move this. And now I don't think quite as many of my slides are blue anymore. So hopefully we won't be getting this glare. So, Yes, this presentation is all about choosing which business entity is right for you. Um, as Donna Lisa has pretty much already given my full introduction, but I really do love working with small businesses. I was at a um, woman owned business for almost six years as their in-house counsel. And while that business had sort of outgrown its smallness, it was still really fun to get to work directly with the um, chief executive officer, the other VPs on strategy for the business as a group. So I work on everything that an in-house counsel would work on, forming the entity, creating contract packages, reviewing uh, outside contracts, reviewing requested red lines to current contracts, um, hiring, firing, employment practices, and then of course, intellectual property protection, which is huge for small businesses. Um, Yes, yeah, so went to UT and then I moved to Colorado for a few years and I am back. I am based out of Dallas, but serve clients throughout Texas through a virtual law firm. And I work, um, like I said, mostly on contracts, business entities, employment, and IP. So just a quick overview of my practice areas, but into the meat of the presentation. So just a quick disclaimer, I have to give this. Um, this is not legal advice. Watching this presentation does not create attorney-client privilege between you and Schaffner Consulting. I've tried to make this presentation as informative as possible, but of course, when you are ready to choose your business entity, please work with an attorney and a tax advisor. We'll be talking about that a bit in this presentation, that there are different pieces of advice that um, tax and financial advisors might have from what an attorney might have. 
So why do we need a business entity, first of all? Can't we just keep operating um, as ourselves, sole proprietor with a DBA? Uh, we'll be talking about that in the next few slides, but I love this house picture. Whenever I'm talking to my clients about how to protect their business entity, what they need to do to protect the corporate veil, I talk about a house. When you create a business entity, you build a structure around your business. Your business lives inside of this house and you, the owner and any other owners that might come into the business later are outside. Then all of the other outside factors, customers, clients, vendors, third parties who you might have disputes with, they're all outside. They're all trying to get in. So it's your job as an owner operator to keep your house strong, do your repairs, replace your roof, make sure your windows are sealed tight so that your business is protected. That's the whole purpose of having a business entity as we'll talk about. So Texas has uh, the pretty typical business structures that we see, but I do wanna dig in a little bit because there are several options and then each option has some sub options. So we have our sole proprietorship. This is just one person running a business using their personal social security number. Sometimes you have a DBA, sometimes you don't. A general partnership is basically the same thing as a sole proprietorship, except with multiple people. It's just multiple people coming together to form a business with no um, actual filing. A corporation, limited liability companies, limited partnerships. And then in Texas, we do have the variety of a limited liability partnership. So then a few kind of subcategories that we have, subchapter S corporations. We'll dig in a little bit on this, but um, just as a point of clarity, subchapter S is a federal IRS designation for tax purposes. You can choose to be an LLC or a corporation or a partnership, et cetera, at the Texas level. And then if you have chosen corporation or LLC, you can work with a tax advisor to choose if an S corp designation is right for you at the IRS level. So I, I a lot of times have people say something like, oh, I'm an S corp. I'm like, great, but are you an LLC or a corporation? Because you could be both. And um, we do have series limited liability companies in Texas. These um, 15 states allow these. They're kind of specialized usually used in real estate. Um, there's some other use cases for them as well. And we also have limited liability, limited partnerships. So sole proprietorships and general partnerships. Uh, the pro, they're free. You don't have to file anything with the state. You do have to pay taxes, but these are disregarded entities. So they just flow through to your personal income statement on the Schedule C. Um, cons. You are operating under a DBA. In Texas, you file what's called an assumed name certificate, and you're allowed to use that name in the counties that you file in um, for up to 10 years, but you do not have any protection. The counties uh, do not do any checking to see if there's other companies using that name, nor does using that name give you any protection. And there's little liability protection for the owners. Basically, you are the business and any liability that the business might have, you have as well. So in general, I do not think these are a good idea for businesses. Um, occasionally have clients who've been operating as a sole proprietor a GP two years to test their business idea before they register. But really overall, it's not something that I would suggest considering if you want to actually grow your business. And this is just an example I like to use. Uh, Avo is a website where people can post questions for lawyers to answer. So what can they do? They can do nothing because the, uh, the state will stop LLCs, corporations, and limited liability partnerships from registering names that are too similar to yours. But if you are just using a DBA, unless you can go so far as to prove consumer recognition for trademark purposes, which is um, far more expensive than just going ahead and filing for the entity with Texas, there's not much to do. 
So what are the uh, characteristics of corporations? Corporations are the oldest business structure. They've been around since I think the late 1800s, came around in Delaware. They are created by statute. So in Texas, we have the Texas Business Organizations Code, which is a state law that says, here is what a corporation is, here's how you create one, and here's how you maintain one. So, so long as you're following the statutory guidelines, you have a corporation that gives you the legal right to put all of the liability of the business with the business and not with the owners of the business. So this is where we build our house. And traditionally, a corporation has been considered to be the strongest type of house. Um, however, as we'll discuss, limited liability companies have been around now for, I think, uh, nearly 50 years. And so their strength is almost as close, if not as the same amount as a corporation. Um, so just some uh, terminology that we use. When you have a corporation, it is owned by shareholders. The high level control is by the board of directors. And then the day-to-day -day management is by the officers. So if you think about a really large corporation like GE that's traded on a public stock exchange, the shareholders are a mixture of individuals, institutional um, investors, and then mutual funds that probably you and I are invested in and we don't even know that we own GE because it's through our funds that we're all in. Um, and then the board of directors for a public corporation is a mix of um, large owners. So those institutional advisors or investors that own 10% of GE are gonna have a seat on the board. Uh, some of the management of the company, but then also independent directors. Typically with um, a non-public corporation, what's known as a closely held corporation, AKA owner operated, you don't typically have independent uh, shareholders. Instead, the shareholders also sit on the board. And then when we talk about officers, we're talking about C-suite, chief executive officer and down. President, vice presidents can also be considered officers depending on what your um, schedule of authorities says. Um, so when we have large corporations, typically all these positions are held by different people. But when we have small, and, and not even small, some medium and larger, just not publicly traded companies, but especially owner operated companies, the shareholders are also directors and they're also officers. So it's important to know what position you are acting in when you make certain decisions for the company. So like I said, the shareholders and directors can be passive, but they can also be involved in the business day to day if they're designated as officers or employed as employees in whatever capacity they have expertise in. Um, sub, so I do not give any advice on sub chapter S designation. That is a purely tax designation that your tax advisor needs to tell you if you should make, but it does limit the number of shareholders you can have and who those shareholders can be. But in a subchapter C corporation, a regular C corp, as people refer to it as, you can have unlimited number of shares and unlimited number of shareholders, and those shareholders don't have to be people. This is how we create subsidiary companies when we have a company own another company, and that's allowed in a corporation. And the, with a corporation, the business itself is subject to tax at both the state and the federal level. Texas does not have personal income tax, but we do have state level franchise taxes. Um, they are not only applicable to franchises, um, it's just the terminology the state chose to basically uh, call something that's a state business tax, not a business tax. So it's your franchise taxes. And no matter if you have income or profit, or if you're below the profit threshold for actually owing taxes, you still have to file a franchise tax report with the Texas Comptroller's Office. And at the same time, you file your public information report, which is fed to the Secretary of State. But this is where we get the traditional corporations are double taxed. If you are the owner of a business, and your business makes $1,000 in profit, the business is going to pay taxes on it. And say it's a 
25% tax rate. Now you have $750 left over and you're going to distribute that to yourself as a dividend. You then also pay tax at your personal income tax level on that dividend amount. And that's the so-called double taxation for corporation. So then when we get in, the, uh, the IRS has kind of dealt with this with the subchapter S um, designation, which basically changes your not pass-through entity into a pass-through. And again, it's not really stuff that I like to get too deep into because I'm not a tax advisor, but it's a way to kind of minimize the double taxation of a corporation. We have cooperatives in Texas, which are very specific types of entities um, that uh, organizations use. We have electric co-ops. Depending on where you live, that might be your electric provider. And then we have nonprofit corporations. Again, your nonprofit status is by the IRS through a 501c filing. But before you do that, you need to actually create a corporation in Texas. And Texas does allow you to designate it as intended to be nonprofit. So our pros and cons. They offer, like I said, really strong legal liability protection for the owners. That so-called corporate veil that you're building with your house over your business is strong to start off with. Um, and it's a really good vehicle for passive investment because you can have as many shares as you want and as many shareholders. I have companies who decide to issue 1 million shares of their company. They might own those million shares for five years and then start selling them off. Um, but typically we talk in numbers of shares and not percentages. So it feels like you have more to give. Um, and it's a much easier way to bring people in and say, hey, do you wanna buy 10% of my corporation? You don't have to sit on the board, you don't have to be an employee, but you'll get the dividends. Um, and when we get into more sophisticated advisors, sometimes they are more comfortable with corporations because they have been around longer. There's more case law built up against them. And so long as we're following the statutory formula for keeping the corporation alive, then we know there's not gonna be any liability for us as the owner. Um, and then the other thing about a corporation is that as long as it's a private corporation, the ownership is private. Excuse me. At the state level, you only need to disclose the directors. And again, the directors don't have to be owners. They can be. So even when people look up the public information report, there's no way for them to figure out who all of the owners are. But some cons. Like I said, it is based on a statutory formula. You have to follow it. You have to have annual meetings of the shareholders and directors. You have to pass a resolution adopting and approving the minutes of those meetings. You have to keep books and records. If you don't, now missing one meeting, is that gonna ruin your house? No, but it might be a leak around a window. And over time, those leaks uh, get bigger and we do end up piercing our veil for not following good corporate governance. And then again, they can be expensive to maintain because we have to actually hold those annual meetings. If it's just you and your spouse or you and a business partner, sure, you go to a coffee shop or go to a nice restaurant, have your dinner, have your meeting, record the minutes. But if you start having five or 10 passive investors and you have to give them all proper notice of meetings, give them the opportunity to show up, hold it in a venue, it starts costing some money. Um, and again, those formalities can sometimes get in the way of nimble business operations. If you're going to make a change, you have to pass a resolution. Now, it's not to say it's not good pre business practice to do that with an LLC, but it's not required. And then again, as we discussed, it's possible that you end up with double taxation depending on how you're structured. So then um, in the late 70s, some businesses were getting kind of sick of dealing with the um, a structure of a corporation, and Wyoming was the first state to create what's known as a limited liability company. Through a limited liability company, it's also a statutory entity type. We have in the Texas Business Orgs Code, Title III, tells us how to be a limited liability company. And it also gives the liability of the company to the entities and not the owners, like a corporation. And when we get into terminology, we're owned by members, we're controlled by managers. And then again, uh, the managers can be passive 
or sorry, the members can be passive or they can be managers as well and make the high level decisions. And then any member and any manager can also be employed day to day. Because LLCs have become so popular and used by so many businesses that we've kind of blurred some lines and we're starting to end up as officers in LLCs. And by starting to, I mean, for the last 10 years, there's been officers in LLCs. So we have CEOs of LLCs, we have vice presidents of LLCs. They're not technically necessary. In a corporation, you have to have a CEO. The CEO's role is to report what the business is doing to the board of directors to be that conduit between the two. A limited liability company does not require that, so you don't have to have a CEO. The highest level manager of an LLC can call themselves whatever they want. We just know that um, a lot of times my small business clients want to call themselves the CEO because they want some legitimacy and you can do that. But one of the reasons the LLC came around was because of the taxation as well. LLCs are considered disregarded entities or pass-through entities, which means that it's like you're operating a sole proprietorship where all of the income and losses of the business roll up to you on your personal tax return. And the business itself is not required to file a business tax separate from what is disclosed as business um, income and business expenses on your personal income tax return. If you're an LLC who's not taxed as an S corp, you're actually filing a Schedule C, I'm sorry, a Schedule S as well, like you would be with a sole proprietorship. Kelsey, we do have a couple of LLC questions. Yep. Um, so Lynette, she asked a little while ago, if I'm working on getting my hub, should I wait to create an LLC, which could be a while, or go ahead and start the hub process as a sole proprietor? Um, I would actually suggest starting the LLC first. I mean, as far as how long it takes at the state, it's three days from filing to getting approved. Um, you mean it might be a while just from being comfortable doing that and spending the money. Um, I understand that issue, but the entity is different. And in fact, when you go from a sole proprietorship, a sole proprietorship can have an EIN, but it's almost always your social security number. So that when you file for an LLC, you're going to need to go over to the IRS's website and get an EIN, which stands for employer identification number. And it's essentially the business equivalent of a social security number. It changes. And then you're going to have to change that number on not only your hub filing, but with all your vendors, with all your suppliers. So it's best to make your entity decision first before you start going down the road of entering into contracts. Um, again, when you enter into a contract, you're entering into a contract with an entity. So if you're a sole proprietor, you'd say, um, this contract is between Kelsey Schaffner, DBA, Schaffner Consulting, PA, uh, Schaffner Consulting, but really my clients are, contracting with Schaffner Consulting PLLC, whose sole member is Kelsey Schaffner. Does that make sense? And Sharonda had a question. Do you have to have annual meetings as an LLC s core if there is no other members? And no, and we'll talk about that. So the s corp is, again, the IRS designation, and it's the way that your business is taxed. Um, the LLC itself is the state level entity that's giving you as the owner liability protection from the business's debts and liabilities. And in Texas, LLCs are not required to have annual meetings. Um, again, when you have a business partner, it's highly advisable to meet on a regular basis. And it's highly advisable to pass resolutions when you make big decisions. But no, if it's just you, you do not have to hold a technical annual meeting like you would if you were a corporation at the Texas level. So again, I, I just kind of hammer this home because it's confusing and a lot of people get tripped up on this, even people who have owned businesses for a while. The S Corp is the IRS for federal tax purposes. The LLC versus the corporation is at the state level for both um, your requirements for keeping your business entity structure um, 
uh, solid. And then, you know, um, again, both entities are taxable at the state level, but they're taxed in the same manner, unlike at the federal level. So in the LLC, the profits and losses flow to the owners. So in this situation, if you have $1,000 of profit at the end of the year, you are going to file a Schedule C on your IRS tax return that says, I have $1,000 of profit attributable to my business, and you will pay tax at your personal income tax rate on that $1,000 that money does not have to come out to you. If for say your personal blended tax rate is 25% and that means you have $750 left over, you can then choose to distribute that $750 to yourself and it's no extra tax or you can choose to keep it in the business as operating expense. So the distributions that you make in an LLC are not separately taxed, they've already been taxed as the profit of the business that rolled up to you as the owner. So then, because why not, let's have some fun. We have some variations. Like I said, you can elect to be a subchapter S at the IRS level. We have series LLCs, which allows you to separate the liability of various assets owned by the LLC. Um, this is, I call this, um, entity formation like 301. If this presentation is 101, we've got to uh, get through 201 before we can get to series LLCs because they are, there's very little instruction in the statute on how to create one. So you're really uh, burdened by doing a really thorough job <laughs> so that if someone challenges it, you have a lot of evidence that you did it right but what is right is not as clear as under the corporations or the LLC statutes. So the pros of an LLC. Again, we have strong liability protection for the owners. If at one point in time we could argue that there is a difference between a corporation and an LLC when it came to the strength of the liability protection, that no longer exists. Go to Amazon's website, search around. They have Amazon LLC. They're not concerned about being a corporation. And for their tax advisors, their legal advisors have told them that's okay. Um, we have this flexible structure. We're not required to do all the corporate governance. We don't have to have annual meetings of the members or the managers. We don't have to send out um, the meeting notices if we're going to have them. We don't have to pass resolutions. We don't have to have a CEO. We don't have to have a president, treasurer, or secretary. So um, LLCs typically do end up being good vehicles for owner operators. I do not like giving blanket advice that if you're running a small business, you should have an LLC because everyone's different. We need to go through the steps to make sure that we're choosing what's right for us in our situation. But a lot of times, the flexibility this affords us, that way we don't have to worry about the meetings when it's just us or just us and our spouse or just us and our brother, whatever. Um, we're able to be nimble and to make decisions when we need to without going through the resolution process. And then again, if you're gonna stay a disregarded entity, you don't have to deal with the, uh, the, the double taxation issues that corporations have. Um, in Texas, this is a big star, again, not tax advice. In Texas, franchise taxes for LLCs, there's a minimum profit when the franchise tax kicks in. So if you're making that $1,000 of profit at the end of the year, you have to file your franchise tax report. Um, big red flashing sign here. It does not matter if you have profit. It matters if you have revenue. If you sell one widget, you have revenue. You have to file both your IRS taxes and your state franchise taxes. This is what keeps your um, business entity alive. But when you go into the comptroller's office, if you are below that minimum fra franchise tax threshold, you can file what's called a no tax due report. You still put in your numbers, your revenue and your expenses, and they check the box and say, okay, yes, you are not um, subject to franchise tax. 
Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Of course, talk to your tax advisor. Texas does consider um, related entities to be one. So you cannot just break your business into 10 separate businesses to avoid franchise tax. They all have common ownership. It all rolls up. Kelsey, we have a Facebook question. Okay. Um, Carrie asks, is it true that people with professional licenses like a counselor should have a PLLC? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I am Schaffner Consulting PLLC. I have a Texas bar license. I am required to have a PLLC. Um, there is a chart on the Secretary of State's website that tells um, you what your options are. So as an attorney, I could be a sole proprietor. I could be a PLLC. I could also be a PC, which is a professional corporation, or I could be a limited partnership. So it depends on your license. Um, and this chart is very helpful. For example, insurance agents have an option. Even though they have licenses, they're not required. Um, tax advisors who are not running a tax CPA firm have some options. So the best thing to do is to check that form. I believe if you said counseling, I'm again, I'm not checking it off the top of my head. I do believe that counselors Anyone in the medical field has to have a PLLC. Um, the one kind of catch with a PLLC is that all of the owners have to hold the same license. So the example I like to give is that for a long time, my husband had a CPA license and I have a bar card. We cannot own a combined uh, law and accounting firm. We could own a business together if it had nothing to do with law and accounting, but if he had at one point decided to create his own accounting firm, we can't roll it up into my firm. Those have to be separate. There's some kind of different rules that are all in the statute about medical fields, what types of medical professionals can join together, but typically your ownership has to be with that license. So um, you can't have outside investors in a PLLC if they don't or a PC if they don't have the license that you have. Great, okay, and we have one in, um, we have two in the chat. So the first one from Mina, is it tough to switch your company from an LLC to a corporation? Um, it's not terribly hard, it is expensive, or it's more expensive than doing it the same because in Texas you have to file for the new entity and you have to file for the conversion. So it's two separate filings that both cost the same. So you're kind of doubling up. And then you need to talk to a tax advisor about if it's if the change you're making requires a new EIN. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So it's not, it's definitely not insurmountable. I've done several of them this year. Like it happens. People they get advice from one tax advisor and then a few years down the road, their situation changes and they want to make a change. And so they do. And it is definitely possible to do. Okay, great. Thank you. And then one last one. Um, are you familiar with a PBC? And if so, what information can you share? I am not. I, I'm not sure what that stands for. Okay. If I, if I knew what it stands for, some, there are some other, uh, this presentation doesn't, uh, touch on it, but like the PLLCs and PCs, there are some very specific entity types for banks and other types of financial institutions. If you're forming your own bank, um, you're going to need a specialized attorney and not a general small business attorney. Um, she clarified, Kelsey, a public benefit company. Oh, yes. Those you're going to need, I would suggest getting with someone who's um, well-versed in nonprofit law because those go hand in hand with that. All right, we can move on. Okay, so just a few cons with LLCs because I like to balance it out. Again, I'm not here saying the LLC is the only or the best option. Um, sometimes sophisticated investors want a corporation because they want to know that you are going to follow those corporate guidelines. Um, just a quick example here, I, um, in addition to being outside in-house counsel for small businesses, I also work on um, business sales 
I've done everything from just walking away from the debt of the business to selling it for multiple millions of dollars, like very, very varied. But in all cases, the owner wants or the buyer wants to make sure that the seller actually owns the shares or the membership interest of the business that they say that they do. And so if you're an LLC and you've gone 20 years without ever having a meeting, ever passing a resolution, but you say, these are the five owners of my business, it started with me and I brought these other four in and you have no paperwork to show when those other four were brought in, how they were brought in, what they paid, how many shares they were given. There's going to be a level of uncomfort um, that that buyer is going to have that after the transaction, there's not going to be someone else that comes out and says, no, 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 I own those shares and I should be getting this money. So when you have a corporation that every year has to have a meeting of the shareholders and list the shareholders and has to have a meeting of the board of directors and we have to elect our directors and appoint our officers, having that built in reporting structure can also build in some certainty if you're getting to that point down the road. And I, this is not as true as I would like it to be uh, for a con. If you list, you can choose to be member managed or you can choose to be manager managed. If you choose to be manager managed, you do not have to disclose the members, only the managers. But a lot of small businesses say, oh, I'm just member managed, it's just me. Again, just me and my spouse, me and my brother. And so then the owners are, on the Texas Secretary of State website. So the way to kind of get around that is to just go ahead and be a manager managed LLC. Um, so then the other thing with an LLC is as you're bringing people in, you've got to make sure your corporate documents allow for it. Um, a bylaws of a corporation usually just kind of presume that you're having other shareholders and they're written that way. Plus we have our annual meetings to recognize it. But when we're bringing in new members of an LLC, we do need to make sure that we're documenting it correctly for the reasons I just explained. And um, so then the partnerships, typically partnerships are for more specialized type businesses. You see a lot of professional service firms, law firms, accounting firms, et cetera, be limited partnerships. Limited partnerships are also very popular in the investing space. So for like private equity funds or real estate investment groups, um, we see the partnership structure. So a partnership in general is uh, two or more entities coming together to form a for-profit venture. When we have a limited partner, we have to have a general partner. So there has to be at least, again, it has to be at least two. One of them has to agree to be the general partner. And then you can have an unlimited number of limited partners. The general partner is the one running the business and has the liability. So an LP, a limited partnership on itself, does not have, have liability protection. The general partner itself is holding that liability. And then typically the limited partners are pa more passive investors who don't have involvement in day-to-day -day and therefore have limited liability. But then we get into some variations because obviously, again, the GPLP structure as it's known has its advantages because it allows that general partner to basically run it all and be in charge and just have investors, but they have the liability. So, Texas also allows for limited liability, limited partnerships and limited liability, limited partnerships, which I just, I don't know why it tickles me that we have LLLPs, but those are just kind of various, uh, those are the variation of limited partnerships. And again, these are much more situationally specific. Uh, these are very flexible. Those LPs in, can come in and out easily, very good for passive investment. Again, um, at my owner operator business clientele, I have this most frequently with real estate investment. If you want to go raise some money to invest in real estate, an LP can be a good way to do it. I also see it with incubators who have some sort of 
kind of money sitting around to invest in their the businesses that they're helping to grow. So the limited partners can only lose up to what they put in. But again, we don't really have that liability protection. Even if you file the LLP or the LLLP, that liability protection is not as strong as it is with a corporation because the limited partners are still liable for what they put up to what they put in, where if you do a corporation or an LLC right, you don't have any liability. These are also very expensive to maintain. With LLCs and corporations, you file your public information report through the comptroller's office at the same time you file your franchise tax report. And the comptroller's office has some system that was probably built in 1975, but it works, <laughs> that feeds information from the comptroller to the secretary of state. And that's all you have to do to keep your corporation or your LLC alive. There's no filing fee for the public information report. There's no filing fee for the franchise tax report, unless of course you owe franchise tax. Um, some people pay their CPA or their tax advisor to do it. Some people do it on their own. And there's nothing else to do with the Secretary of State. With a partnership, you have to file documents every year and you have to pay a fee for each LP that's in the partnership. So there's just a recurring fee and the more people you have, and when I say people, I'm really referring to an LP can be an LLC, a corporation, an individual, a trust, but the number of LPs you have times the fee every year. Um, it is still subject to franchise tax and the IRS does not love LPs. So when you have an LLC and there's a tax issue, the IRS goes to the LLC itself, the entity. It says, hey, you owe taxes. And the LLC pays the taxes out of their operating account. That affects the members because there's less money to be distributed, but the IRS isn't dealing with the members directly. When you have a partnership, it's less clear where that money is coming from. And technically the IRS is going to have to look to all of the partners to clear the tax liability, and they don't like doing that. So um, the IRS makes it more difficult to be a limited partnership because they don't want to deal with the headache, which I should, I guess, caveat that as my personal opinion, but what my experience with both IRS and the comptroller's office here in Texas is they want to get paid. The comptroller's office, is frankly the best. You can call them up and they will answer your question and they're nice and they're helpful because they wanna make sure people are paying their franchise and their sales and other taxes. And um, they want you to make it easy for them. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. I'm more than happy to answer more questions if we have them, Donna Lisa. Yeah, we have one in the chat. Um, for a business that generates passive income, is it best to remain an LLC or file as an S Corp? And that's definitely a tax advisor question. The thing with the S Corp that I like to just give as a general warning is first of all, if you file for an S Corp designation, you have to remain an S Corp for five years. So if for some reason you file, and then you learn that the S Corp was not right for you, um, you're stuck there. Uh, and the problem with that is that if you misfile for an S Corp, the IRS has a mechanism to try to uh, basically penalize you. So typically the S Corp, what it does is it separates out the income that you're receiving as an employee of your business from the income you're receiving as an owner of your business. So like in a corporation where you're paid a salary as an employee and you're paid a dividend as a, a shareholder of the corporation, you're doing that. So if you set up an S Corp, you have to start paying, I say yourself, but paying all of the owners of the company start, have, start to have to get a salary. And so you have to be able to justify that that salary is market-based and appropriate for the role you're playing. And then you have to show that that uh, distribution income that you're getting is earned outside 
of your typical employment duties. So for example, in a law firm, if you have associates and the associates are doing work and then you're billing it through to the client at a higher rate, you're making some income that's not attributable to your own work. And that's an appropriate um, type of income to be a distribution as opposed to a, um, a salary. So as far as what your passive income is, I'm not sure. Um, hopefully that kind of clarified it. But again, I would talk to a tax advisor. Uh, just a fair warning, there are a number of CPAs who will just say, yes, S-Corp, everyone should be an S-Corp. But if you get that answer immediately, I would just dig in a little bit because know that there are consequences for choice if it's wrong. Um, so Chantel wanted to know, and I don't. I hope this isn't a repeat, do you have any information on B Corp? A benefit corporation? Benefit corporation, no. We see C certified B Corps now in out in the marketplace where companies will be certified B Corp. There are some states, and I cannot offhand remember which ones, that actually allow you to register your entity as a B Corp at the state level. However, there is a separate governing body um, that gives B Corp designations to businesses if they meet the criteria. So if you in your inbox got an email from a business that you are on the email list from that says, wonderful news, we're now a B Corp. Most likely what happened is they received that certification from, I think it's like bcorporation.org that is that independent certifying body. And it's more of a marketing tool, but there are states not Texas, that have B Corps for certain types of public benefit companies. Um, okay, and Lynette has a question. She says, I am growing, I am a growing business and need capital to make some needed technology changes. After this presentation, I'm thinking supportive friends and family might want to invest and get a return, but not be too involved. Could an LLC do this for me? I provide educational services. Uh, yes. So the way that the, the investment works in an LLC is the passive, I'll call them passive members, are either given or purchase a certain number, uh, amount of membership units. And so like I said, I kind of glossed over this with the LLC, but the corporation you issue shares and you can choose how many shares. It's all one pie. If you have a hundred shares or a million shares, eventually it all comes down to percentages. But it's kind of easier to give someone a hundred shares, even if that happens to be 1.96%. But in an LLC, we talk about membership units. And so it's, some people talk about it in percentages and some of my clients will an issue a thousand membership units. So however you have it set up, what you would do is you would document that you are issuing those memberships to those people. Um, if they're doing it in exchange for an investment, then you have to assign a fair market value to the company, which they're then purchasing those units at. You pass a resolution that you're doing this, you get the money in the bank account, then you have a LLC that's essentially owned, let's say 90% by you, 5% by relative A, 5% by relative B. At the end of the year, when you're looking at your PL statement to see how much profit you have, the managing um, body of the LLC decides how much distribution to make. So if you're a member managed, then it would be up to a vote of the members. How many members? It depends on your LLC agreement. So in this presentation, we didn't talk much about the company agreement bylaws, but this is where they get really important, is that your LLC agreement will state that the members can issue a dividend upon a uh, unanimous vote or a majority vote or a super majority vote. Or if your manager managed, most likely your LLC agreement will say something like, we have X number of managers and they're appointed by the members who own more than 50%. So if you own 90%, you control the board and those other two members really don't have anything to do with decision making, except for some like 
closing the business type decisions. Um, so you as the board would say, I'm gonna issue a dividend. The dividend is paying you, but then it's also paying them. So if you're issuing a hundred dollar dividend, $90 goes to you, five to the other, five to investor A, five to investor B. So um, it's essentially the same way a distribution, a dividend works with a corporation where the board decides to make it and then it pays out. So they would get their money back by the company doing well. Now, of course, it can get much more complicated and you can put agreements in place that they are uh, have a guaranteed return or they're going to get their money back in next years. But the simple way is just to kind of bring them into the distribution pool. She said that was very helpful. Thank you. So then Donna asked, she's been in business as a sole proprietor for five years. What is the process to change from sole proprietor to LLC? I provide a service. What do you advise? So when anyone is filing an LLC, um, there are paper applications. I don't suggest them. Um, I don't know if it's been like this in the past, but at least through since pandemic started, everyone at the Secretary of State's office is still pretty much working at home. And so the paper application process is really slow. You either mail or fax it. Even if you pay the expedited fee, which varies depending on your filing, it's still going to take a couple of weeks. Uh, you can file online through SOS Direct, and that takes about three, no more than three business days. I had one instance where I had it take four, and that was weird. <laughs> so two to three business days when you file on SOS Direct, um, you will have to search for your business name to see if the DBA you have been using um, is available as an actual business name. If it's not, you can always file a DBA. So for example, my business name is Schaffner Consulting PLLC, but my website is Schaffner PLLC because Schaffner Consulting PLLC.com felt like a lot of letters. <laughs> so I actually filed a DBA for Schaffner PLLC because I do business as that. I am known as that as well in the business world. So um, it's very common for LLCs and corporations to have DBAs. There's a myriad of reasons. One is the sole proprietor turns over, their name isn't available. Um, another reason is that you want to have kind of um, several businesses running under the same corp uh, company umbrella, which is possible as long as you're not a PLLC or PC. Um, uh, or people just choose to change their name and you don't want to go through a whole name change process with the Secretary of State, you just file a DBA. So if your name is not available, it's important to figure out who is using the name because that creates some state and federal trademark issues. If it just happens that someone is using... Um, there actually apparently used to be a Schaffner Consulting in Houston. They closed long before I opened. Obviously, it would have been an issue. They were not lawyers. I can't, I don't even know what type of consulting they did. They just showed up on Google for a while until my um, website got enough hits and I moved up past them. So uh, if they were still active, I wouldn't be able to use that name. So I'd go Google them and go, oh, well, they're not a law firm. So I don't have any trademark issues because they're not in the same federal class. Now this is getting into a, a whole nother presentation, but essentially you want to file through SOS Direct for an LLC or a corporation. Just know that your name might not be available if you've been using the DBA. If it's not available, find out who's using it to make sure you don't have potential trademark issues. But otherwise it's a pretty simple process. Um, a lot of lawyers do it. It's something I do. SOS Direct, you have to have a login. Anyone can get a login. Uh, it's not the easiest website to use. It's been the same since I was in law school. <laughs> so it's been a while updating it. But yeah, it's absolutely by yourself. Typically, lawyers come in just because we know how to do it right and help with those company agreements and getting everything set up on the back end. But um, that's how you switch. If you've been using your social then you need to go to just Google IRS EIN and they have a, a really easy form for filling out um, and getting the EIN immediately. Just make sure you do it through the IRS and not through a service who's going to do it for you. 
So Kelsey, she said she already has a DBA and an EIN. Would she need to switch her EIN number for the LLC? Um, based on my research, yes. Uh, you could talk to a tax advisor. They might have different advice, but that's how I read the IRS website. All right. Do we have any more questions? Going once, going twice. Tracy, did you want to pop back on? Would you please show her information about how to reach her? Yeah, thank you. There you go. I just realized I was sitting on the wrong um, sheet. So the best way to reach me is via email, kelsey at schaffnerplc.com. Feel free to visit my website. I do have a contact me form you can fill out as well. And that reaches my email. Um, I also always plug, definitely follow me on LinkedIn, connect with me there. I also have an Instagram account, although it's pretty much just what's on my LinkedIn and I'm personally much more active on my LinkedIn site, but I post tips and um, informative. I share other events. I'm very active in the Dallas um, woman business community. Um, so I try to share as much as I can of what's going on there. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Did you say at the beginning, you also review business contracts and assist in drafting those? Yes, I do. So um, typically the kind of cadence with my firm is that people come to me to open their entity, but then they immediately need um, a standard terms and terms and conditions for their clients or customers, or they need an independent contractor agreement. Of course, you don't have to, if your entity exists, I do this as well, but that's honestly my bread and butter is contract drafting. I'm kind of a nerd. I really love it. <laughs> it's like, it's my way of being creative and writing. But yes, I do all kinds of contracts, both writing them um, and also reviewing when you receive contracts from third parties. Okay, thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Okay, so um, if we don't have any more questions, Kelsey, thank you so much for your time this evening and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. We appreciate that so much. Um, we did record this. We will send out um, the replay and the slide deck um, probably next week on Monday, um, since it is the holiday. And then next week, so next Tuesday, um, we do have Bookkeeping and Financial Statements 101 with Nancy from NSH Bookkeeping and Consulting. And those are always um, a really great class. Um, make sure you bring a pen and paper to take notes. Um, and then Tracy, did you need to pop back on or? Well, I just wanted to say, Kelsey, thank you so much for coming, especially on this short week. <laughs> uh, great information. I see lots of really nice comments in there, and some will have additional questions for you, so I'm happy um, for that. Thank you again for being here, and everyone else, thank you so much. We, again, we know this is a tough week, but it's glad to, I'm glad to see so many of you online tonight. Um, and if there's anything we can do to help, just let us know or any questions for us. But Kelsey, once again, thank you. Of course. And that just reminded me, if you do reach out, just let me know that you saw this presentation so I know you came through TWU. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so thank you. much. Of course. Everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy time with your family. And don't forget to take some time and rest. <laughs>